Welcome to the Erectile Dysfunction Radio Podcast. This is the podcast dedicated to educating and empowering men to address erectile dysfunction, improve confidence, and enhance the satisfaction in their relationships. This podcast is brought to you by ErectionIQ.com. Learn more at ErectionIQ.com. Welcome to the Erectile Dysfunction Radio Podcast. I am Mark Goldberg, Certified Sex Therapist. I am deeply passionate about working with men like you to help resolve their ED. On today's episode, we are joined by Dr. Jeffrey Banker. Dr. Banker is a cardiologist practicing at LifeBridge Health in Baltimore, Maryland. He graduated from the Pritzker School of Medicine at the University of Chicago and completed his internal medicine residency at Columbia Presbyterian and New York Cornell Hospitals. He is a fellow of the American College of Cardiology, Heart Rhythm Society, and European Society of Cardiology. So to remind our listeners, this is a third episode in a four-part series where we are discussing a unique presentation of erectile dysfunction that required multidisciplinary coordination of care and addressing some medical concerns. On the previous episode, we explored the possibility of allergic reactions with Dr. Siegel. One of the other features of the presenting case was that the client or patient would have shortness of breath and fainting spells after sexual activity. These symptoms clearly raise some potential medical concerns and can also be attributed to psychological causes, including high levels of acute anxiety or panic, which may be relevant for many of our listeners. So Dr. Banker, just to get us started here, people pass out or faint for a variety of reasons. Can you share with us what some of the primary concerns are when someone presents with fainting spells? The common denominator for anybody who loses consciousness is that the brain is not receiving perfusion or circulation. And that usually comes from a very low blood pressure. So that that would be true in basically every, every case. The issue becomes what was the cause of the low blood pressure? So oftentimes, the concern would be that the heart is not functioning to pump the blood throughout the body to get a blood pressure to the brain, and that leads to the, to the loss of consciousness. So the first step in, 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 in my workup is to rule out some sort of heart disease, whether the heart function or the rhythm of the heart, there's an issue there, and, and that needs to be ruled out. So if I'm understanding you correctly, what causes these fainting spells is low blood pressure. But the question really is, what causes the low blood pressure? And you're saying one of the primary concerns of the primary rule out, first and foremost, is some kind of heart pump issue or heart disease. Is that correct? Correct. And once once you establish that the heart function is, is okay, or, or you rule out that the patient go, is not going into a very fast or a very slow heart rhythm, then it becomes a concern of why is the blood pressure suddenly dropping? And since the control of the blood pressure is modulated by what we call the autonomic nervous system, the sympathetic nervous system, the parasympathetic nervous system, which are, 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 is not voluntary, the next level of suspicion is that somewhere along the line, the balance between these two components of the autonomic nervous system is somehow being poorly regulated. So somewhere along the line, one of the nervous systems is taking over and, and dropping the blood pressure leading to the, the fainting spell. Okay. So Dr. Banker, what, what could it mean when the fainting spells seem to be occurring after physical exertion as it presented in this case? The history in, you know, most, most evaluations of fainting, it's really the history that leads us to the, usually the process that's, that's causing the event, more so than the diagnostic testing, more so than the physical exam, especially in a other, you know, young, healthy person that you wouldn't really be suspicious has any underlying condition. So when a person is at rest, resting, eating, sleeping, relaxing, their parasympathetic nervous system is stimulated to cause a low heart rate, a low respiratory rate, or a state of relaxation. When a person is exercising or running, the sympathetic nervous system or the adrenaline 
related nervous system takes over. So, and throughout the day, since we're not either sound asleep or running down the street, we're somewhere in between, there's a, a sort of a pendulum of parasympathetic activity and sympathetic activity. But what's very common is that a person might be sitting down in a parasympathetic state, shall we say, and then they go to get up and walk or exercise or go up a flight of stairs and the sympathetic nervous system kind of takes over and then they stop and then they sit back down and then the parasympathetic nervous system kind of lowers the blood pressure, lowers the heart rate, pulls things back to their, their, their baseline. So this pendulum is going back and forth all day long, depending on a person's level of activity. So it's very common that you can imagine that if a person is exercising and then stops exercising and stops, sits down, rests, that there is the potential sometimes for the parasympathetic nervous system to sort of overshoot. You know, if I use the, the analogy of the pendulum, kind of like overshoot, instead of bringing things just back down to baseline, may actually go beyond the normal lowering of heart rate and blood pressure and and cause things to go so low that the patient might pass out or lose consciousness. And that mechanism is is very prominent in what we call vasovagal fainting or vasovagal syncope, which is the common fainting when a person gets very anxious or a person gets very nervous or a person might see like a movie star or a famous football player that they suddenly get this rush of adrenaline and then, again, using the pendulum analogy, the parasympathetic ner nervous system pulls the pendulum back towards the middle. But since the stimulation was so rapid, the acceleration of the stimulation was so rapid, the deceleration back to baseline is so rapid, it kind of overshoots. So you go from a normal state to a high blood pressure, high heart rate state. And then the parasympathetic kind of kicks in and pulls things back, but pulls it back too low that instead of going back down to normal, like a, in an elastic way back to baseline, it, it, it overshoots and you end up getting low blood pressure, low heart rate, and, and you faint. Okay. So if I'm, if I'm understanding you correctly, the sympathetic system is what gets the heart rate up. Uh, during excitation, physical exertion, or uh, even seeing something exciting could raise or activate the, the sympathetic system. Any, yeah, any, whether it's audio, visual, anything that's going to release adrenaline, person sees blood, person hears bad news, anything, anything that might be sti stimulate the body to release adrenaline, a good test score on an exam, a bad test score on an exam, whatever the case may be. Yeah, so the parasympathetic system, though, is what helps to downregulate that and try it tries to help the body get back to baseline. But you're saying sometimes it overshoots, resulting in lower blood pressure than where uh, it should ideally be, um, potentially leading to a fainting spell. Is that correct? Correct, which is why um, these kinds of vagal events typically occur more often in younger people because this ability to stimulate the sympathetics and downregulate the sympathetics, stimulate the parasympathetic. This autonomic nervous system pendulum is most elastic in a younger person. As we get older, our ability to react and, and change the, the nervous state is, is not as elastic. So it typically doesn't occur. That's that's going to be important for the uh, younger listeners of this podcast, but also in the in the uh, case that we're going to be discussing, who was a patient who was on the younger side. But just to clarify one step further, so with uh, sympathetic and parasympathetic involvement, does that impact the heart? It, it's 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 affecting both the circulation and the heart. The when the sym sympathetics are the, the, that's a very good point. Um, maybe we should zoom zoom out a little bit. So when the sympathetics are turned on, the heart rate goes up, the, the contractility of the heart, the squeeze of the heart increases, and um, the blood pressure then goes up. When the parasympathetic is stimulated, the heart rate goes down, contractility of the heart goes down, the, the, the force of the squeeze, and the peripheral blood vessels actually dilate. So 
it's a uh, yeah it, both this, the, the the entire circulation as well as the heart function itself are directly innervated with both the parasympathetic and the sympathetic fibers so as soon as adrenaline is released or as soon as the brain says okay time to shut everything down the entire circulatory system gets affected immediately got it so let's let's kind of lean in to sexual activity. So is there any reason that masturbation or other sexual activity would indicate or lead to heart problems? I don't think it would lead to heart problems, but if you look at if you look at the autonomic nervous system as it regulates or assists activity and then the the climax of activity, you have the initial state of at least for a man you have the parasympathetic state is the nervous system that leads to erectile function. It leads to the stimulation. And then the actual climax is purely sympathetic. And then after the sympathetic causes for a man the discharge, then you, the parasympathetic then takes over. So actually the entire course of stimulation to climax to relaxation is purely regulated or assisted by the autonomic nervous system. So the, sl- the, the boomerang effect that you were describing before could be, or, or maybe is a part of sexual excitation leading to sure. it, orgasmic it, it, climax. And then that resolution is really the parasympathetic system. Yeah. I mean, that's exactly what you're getting. That's ex- exactly what, what's occurring is, um, so if it, this this dual stimulation of parasympathetics followed by sympathetics followed by the parasympathetic it's just that the intensity of with which um, one takes over shouldn't happen so when the when the climax happens and the parasympathetic takes over um or or you know de- relax you know down regulates everything it shouldn't it shouldn't really uh, lower the blood pressure and heart rate to the point of fainting. But um, again, in younger people who have very, very elastic um, autonomic nervous systems, meaning that they can they can actually rev up and rev down pretty quickly, they very much can can overshoot. And the truth is, yeah, the therapy um, in general for for younger people, teenagers, twenties who have recurrent fainting or these recurrent vagal episodes. A lot of times, what we treat them with is serotonin reuptake inhibitors because the, the, by increasing more serotonin in the heart, at least, um, there's less of a chance for the, the heart to actually get affected by these these rapid changes in the autonomic nervous system. It, it's very it's very interesting how uh, this only happens mostly in, in younger people. It is, it is really fascinating, especially when we begin to talk about SSRIs, you know, a topic that we've spoken about, the impact on uh, just the entire body from the, uh, from the brain, but also the, the peripheral uh, parts of the body. It becomes really, really fascinating to think about the you know, potential impacts here on erections. Now, Dr. Becker, this patient, I believe, was placed on some sort of monitor. Can you explain to our listeners about this device and what was being tested? So the sure. So the two diagnostic tests that were done again to really make sure that we're not dealing with a, a heart condition. Um, one would be that there's something structurally abnormal with the heart, maybe something congenital or something the patient's born with. So we just do a simple ultrasound of the heart to rule that out. But the heart monitor is really to see if there's um, some sort of rhythm disturbance um, that that is ne- not necessarily related to this specific event, but that the patient may have and some kind of abnormal heart rhythm that's that just seems to come up at, at, during times where he's uh, where he's having these events, both of with which were negative. But the heart monitor is a very easy device. It's a very useful tool because it's just a patch that's worn on the skin for 14 days and it just monitors the heart. Um, what we were hoping to find is the, if he, if, if he actually had an event uh, during, while he was wearing the patch, which 
He didn't, fortunately, but um, if he were, we were hoping to see what the heart rate was doing during one of these events. And what, what one would expect is that right before fainting, when the parasympathetic nervous system is being stimulated, the heart would basically stop. You would actually get almost like a flat line for a few seconds, uh, which is what the pure stimulus of the vagal nerve during, or the parasympathetic nervous system during one of these events, what you would expect to find. Um, so Dr. Banker, just to bring this bring this down to terra firma here for a moment. So you would be able potentially to see an overextension of the parasympathetic uh, system trying to downregulate the heart rate. That should be apparent on sometimes. the monitor. Okay. Sometimes. So 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 the so the truth is that within um, vagal episodes, again, as I as I started by saying, there's two possibilities. One a patient faints because they have a low blood pressure to a patient faints because they have a low heart rate within, within one of these, um, what the fancy term for is neurocardiogenic events. One of these autonomic nervous system stimulations of, 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 of stopping the circulation. What occurs in some people, just their blood vessels dilate and a dilated blood vessel on a flush to the face, dropping the blood pressure, they faint. But in some people, the term is what's called cardio inhibitory. That in some people, actually, what ha- what occurs is that the heart rate, uh, the blood pressure does dilate, the, the blood pressure does drop a little bit. But the but the cause of lack of perfusion of the brain and ultimately fainting is that the heart just stops. The heart actually just shuts down and and pauses for a few for enough of a period of time for a patient to lose consciousness. Um, so, and, and that, that, that can be seen. So that's what we were looking for on the monitor. In this particular case, the patient actually did not really have any events while he wore the monitor. So it's hard to say um, whether or not that was the case. Wh- wh- which, which was the more prominent feature of the loss of consciousness, the blood pressure or the heart rate? In other words, since no events occurred, even though the patient you know, did engage in sexual activity during that time, um, there was you know, no abnormalities. And I think no symptoms reported by the patient Correct. during the time period Correct. as well. So that kind of you're saying Correct. left like uh, a question mark here, but I think also that probably indicates that there isn't an ongoing medical issue. Is it, are you able to conclude that from the results of the monitor, given that the patient over the course of 14 days engaged in exertion, engaged in sexual activity, or could there be something which is uh, physical, but cyclical? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I, I think that, again, I think it's important to point out that if this is what was occurring, which it seems like it was this, this vagal, these vagal events, um, this overstimulation, and then um, this overswinging of the pendulum. I, you know, although it, it leads to fainting, and although obviously that's very, very disconcerting for both the patient or anyone who's with the patient, I, 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 I'm always hesitant to declare it as a medical condition because it really is just the normal, sort of super normal, if you will, uh, nervous system behavior. It needs to be modified. It needs to be modified usually with, with medication if it's recurrent and it's, it's affecting their life. Um, but it's not, and it's not a disease. It's not like an abnormality. It's more of like a super ality, if you will. I mean, it's a, it's just a very, very extreme elastic performance of the nervous system that most of us don't really experience because, uh, we don't have that, uh, tremendous, I guess, for whatever reason that very precise wiring. So it's not really a disease, and, that, and, and, and that's why it usually manifests teenage years to 20s, and then as people get a little bit older, it just kind of usually goes away by itself because they no longer have that uh, ability to swing the pendulum so quickly. So let's kind of build off of that for a moment and get into, I guess, where this probably gets a little bit more complex, um, and that is that this patient, as an example, had presented with... Uh, this overfunctioning of the parasympathetic system um, and was having these fainting spells and then went on the monitor for 14 days, didn't, which kind of leads to the question that 
comes a little bit back into my arena, but certainly from the medical perspective, mental health can certainly impact the sympathetic and parasympathetic symptoms. So would that be a real factor to begin to consider when you see this happening more intermittently or with psychosocial factors being um, assessed or looked at as contributing factors? Well, yeah, it, for sure. I mean, the whatever, let's say, psychology the patient is experiencing, whatever their emotional state, whatever their anxious state, whatever their environment chemically inside the body is, um, I think is, is very dynamic. And I think it's very hard to predict why something might have occurred like this and whether it's going to be a pattern or whether it's going to occur again. Um, and it becomes very challenging to try to, you know, pick specific neurotransmitters and try to modify them pharmacologically um, to try to prevent things, certain symptoms from occurring, which is why I think in a situation like this, with this particular patient, you know, the probably the best approach is therapy of some kind to try to understand what the angst might be or what the circumstances might be that um, lead to this very intense autonomic behavior during certain activities. It, it, it does become kind of complex and it does become somewhat cyclical and it comes and goes and it's, it, it is very challenging to try to just treat with a, with a medication because the medication is always going to be in the system. It's always going to be affecting the autonomic nervous system. Um, it may actually lead to more dysfunction because you, you need to go be able to, to perform sexually. You need to be able to, 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 to go back and forth between the parasympathetics and the sympathetics. And if you're modulating that pharmacologically alone, long-term, it, it actually may make things worse, which is probably why a lot of these medicines have the side effects that they do. So yes, I think I agree with you. I think that in a situation like this, trying to understand the relation, the patient's relationship to the environments with which they seem to um, have this intense autonomic reaction is probably will get you closer to helping the patient than just sort of a blind pharmacologic approach to try to modulate or minimize the autonomic nervous system activity. And Dr. Baker, I was very thankful that the you know, patient was given a, a relatively clean bill of health to be able to go ahead and uh, engage in some of the exposure exercises, um, as well as do the cognitive work so we could really you know, kind of see how that all plays out. Um, knowing that there could be a real mental mental health component that's contributing to this. Now, this patient seemed to have pronounced anxiety around sexual activity, both before and after. And to me, at times, it seemed almost to the point of like a panic attack. Is what you're describing, does that also explain what happens to people during a panic attack, this shift from sympathetic to parasympathetic? Sure. Let's say what we'll consider the experience of panic, whether it's just a, whether it's an appropriate response to an, something or whether it's an inappropriate response. But this, you know, on a chemical level, panic is 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 a very very high state of adrenaline floating around in the body, uh, stimulating all the organs with the adrenaline. Absolutely, I think that um, trying to address why somebody would have a lower threshold to get panicky about something that might not require that kind of response is, is very important because if you can minimize or regulate the upshot, then you can definitely regulate or minimize the reaction, the, the parasympathetic component. So you know, absolutely. I think that, like the examples I had given, the 
hearing the bad news or seeing the movie star or, what, or whatever this get into a car accident, whatever the story might be, something unexpected that causes a release of adrenaline. That's the normal experience, you know, or the typical, but uh, to, to, to have that kind of reaction to something that's more commonplace for a person or anticipated for a person or something they might do on a daily or every other day basis. Yeah. I think that needs to be addressed for sure. In other words, the body is, is designed at its, I guess at its core, at its base to be able to engage in sexual activity, to be able to transition between sympathetic and parasympathetic without generally causing a vasovagal response. Sure. Or, and, or any, or any exercise for that matter, any, any physical activity for that matter. Got it. So Dr. Baker, I guess to wrap up one last point that I'm curious about is you mentioned uh, SSRIs as a, a way to, I guess, increase serotonin levels and decrease the, I guess, the intensity um, of these transitions between sympathetic and parasympathetic. If a younger person, person were to be experiencing um, some of the things that we described here and therapy alone was not quite making the transition. What from your perspective goes into the calculations, kind of weighing the uh, challenges that SSRIs in particular present to a sexual desire and sexual function? And so there's a, yeah, the, 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 right. So the question is, are we yelling, are, are we fainting because we're, we're vasodilating or are we fainting because our heart's pausing? So, you know, if, if we're fainting because the, the parasympathetic stimulation is causing dilation of the blood vessels, then the SSRI might not necessarily do anything. If we're fainting because our heart's stopping for a few seconds, then, then the SSRIs have a, have a pretty good effect. So how do you differentiate between the two? Um, especially if a patient, you know, has infrequent events and monitors, you know, being monitored only for seven, 14 days at a time. So there is a test, a very, very old fashioned test because it's very low tech. It's been around for a long, long time. We don't do it so much anymore, but it is a very, very useful test. And it's what's called the tilt table test. And most hospitals will will still do it. And, And basically it goes on the premise that standing straight, which is, you know, actually a very noxious stimuli, just standing up straight for a long period of time can actually lead to these vasovagal events. In fact, that's why you hear that um, soldiers or people who are standing in attention in the army, you know, for long periods of time, they might just kind of faint, faint in line. So so in the tilt table test, we put a patient basically is kind of fastened comfortably to a table And the table is tilted up, um, not to 90 degrees, probably about 65, 70 degrees. And they stay in that position for about 20, 25 minutes. And we monitor their heart rate and their blood pressure. And they're hooked up to an EKG machine. And we're just watching them. If after about 10, 15 minutes, nothing happens, the next thing we do is infuse adrenaline, a pharmacologic form of, of adrenaline called isopro. And it stimulates the, the beta adrenergic system, just like your own adrenaline. And the heart rate goes up. And then the idea is, is the goal is during this test is to actually make the patient pass out, which is why they're fastened to the table. Um, and if it's a negative test, nothing happens. But a lot of times what we'll see in a younger person is at, the heart rate will shoot up. As, as either with or without the pharmacologic par- portion of it. And then the, that once the heart rate shoots up, it'll slowly, slowly go down to 30, 40, 30, maybe even pause for a few seconds and the patient will lose consciousness. So that, that old fashioned test, which we still do today, can differentiate between what we call cardio inhibitory vasovagal syncope versus vasodilatory. And if we see that it's cardio inhibitory, then the SSRIs are very, very useful because the mechanism of the heart stopping for a few seconds is modulated by the lack of serotonin in the pacemaker cells or in the the conduction system of the heart. And the SSRIs are very effective in preventing that withdrawal. 
So there is a way to actually differentiate whether or not a patient would benefit. But oftentimes it's not so clear cut. The patient may have a tilt table test. It might be negative. You know, maybe there's, this is the autonomic nervous system is so dynamic or like in this, this particular patient's case, it was only during a certain activity, which he would not be engaged in during a tilt table test. Um, it's not always so straightforward. But it is a it's a reasonable test to still do in young people with recurrent fainting, and you want to give them a therapy, and you're not sure which medication to give them. So that 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 would be my approach. So, Dr. Banker, to that end, in, in the cases where it would be theoretically or clinically appropriate to prescribe an SSRI, is this the type of again? I, I'm hesitant to call it a condition because it sounds like this is part of life, and I guess to that end. Does this need to be prescribed in order for the person to maintain health and not put themselves in danger? Or is this a uncomfortable situation, but one that a patient may want to weigh in terms of the potential negative impacts of the sexual side effects of an SSRI? Yeah, I think it's it's more the latter. Uh, when, when, when I deal with patients who experience um, these episodes, m- most of the time, Um, After, again, we rule out anything that that could be wrong with the heart, I I mostly side on, you know, reassurance and frequent follow-up. And um, and there are even some exercises that that we have patients do um, to sort of train their autonomic nervous system. If you look online, there are actually different sorts of um, pressure points, um, exercises where push up against the wall, they push their legs against the wall, they do different stretches and all these different sort of maneuvers of, of, of pushing and releasing, pushing and releasing, bearing down and releasing, it, 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 it actually stimulates and destimulates various parts of the parasympathetic nervous system. And these different maneuvers actually help train the elasticity of the nervous system to not be so hyperreactive, if you will. Uh, so I, 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 nowadays, I, I rarely use pharmacologic therapy for, for these kinds of events. And um, I guess I just think they have too many other um, effects that than just the effect of the heart. So um, yeah, I agree. I think it's a, it's, it's normal. It's, it's super normal behavior. Um, it, it can be modulated, I think, with a lot of reassurance and a lot of different exercises and um, the more a patient's involved or a person's involved in the situation, I think the more they kind of desensitize themselves to the situation. Um, and I, I, I like anything. I think it's just a matter of becoming comfortable in one's skin, comfortable in, in one's environment. And that in and of itself will take away the angst and allow the normal gear switching between the sympathetics and the parasympathetics. And we do that when we're exercising. We do that when we're eating. We do that when we're sleeping. We do that. That that gear shifting occurs all day long. Um, There's no reason for it to be extreme one way or the other uh, in specific environments that involve angst. I think it's just a matter of learning to deal with those situations and demystify or remove the anxiety from those situations. I think that's the best therapy of all. And thankfully, uh, Dr. Branker, you you did give me the go ahead that again, medically, this this client was able to proceed with uh, both the cognitive and the behavioral uh, interventions that are really a part of the psychosexual therapy. And I will not spoil the uh, progression of therapy at this point, but that is how treatment uh, did continue from there. So I really, really appreciate Dr. Branker, you joining with us to kind of explain this part of the really was, was ended up being more of an assessment and a rule out phase that allowed for the treatment to progress, but also just touching on uh, a lot of the important components that are involved in uh, sexual activity and how that impacts the body uh, in general. So this has been very helpful. I think our listeners are going to benefit from hearing this segment and just really deepening their understanding of uh, how all these pieces come together. So again, thank you very much for your time. Sure. Thank you so much.
Thanks for listening to the Erectile Dysfunction Radio Podcast. For more information on today's topic and understanding how the mind impacts erectile dysfunction, please visit ErectionIQ.com. That's ErectionIQ.com.